Welcome back. It's to, in case you just join us, you're watching Plots Politics on Plots TV Africa. National development, which is the continuous improvement that aims at leading a country to higher levels, is a concept critical to the sustenance of any society. Without pre-existing laws, however, the advancement of the society will be a hard hurdle to cross, maybe even impossible to achieve. What then happens? when there are existing laws, but these laws are not duly followed? What would be the result when the rule of law is being openly twisted and in some cases ignored? What then would be the role of the Nigerian bar in the development of our nation? Joining us to throw more light on this question is Olumide Akpata, a legal practitioner, of course. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karade. And good to have you. Uh, maybe I should pu quickly put this on record so that people will know why I might be very, very uh, direct in some of my questions to you. I understand that uh, you're vying to be the president of Nigerian Bar Association. So let me put that on record. But let's look at um, the NBA, the Nigerian Bar as it is. Uh, uh, there's been this issue of the bar and the bench. And uh, for laymen, you always call us on Leonard Bear. <laughs> we always say that... Um, we cannot, you know, separate both of you in terms of how we perceive you. And the easy question that we always come with is, uh, when will judiciary be truly independent? Because it appears that they are just the tools of the executive. Whew, I, I think you are asking the wrong person that question, but... Um, um... And, and you're very correct. Uh, if the judiciary is not independent, the judiciary really cannot perform. Uh, at least that is my personal view. The independence of the judiciary is at the heart of, uh, uh, of, the, of the system of justice. And um, for me, I think um, any government that pays lip service to the or holds on tight to the judiciary in terms of control has no intention of respecting the rule of law or has no intention of respecting the rights of its citizens. So I think, I think the judiciary, uh, uh, its independence is a condition precedent to us having a, a, a country where the rule of law is allowed to uh, flourish unfettered, unhindered. Um, so if you ask me, I think uh, pressure groups and um, and um, pressure groups like the NBA, professional organizations like the NBA, uh, have to continue to clamor for the independence of the judiciary. It is a responsibility we cannot shirk. It is a duty that we must take on uh, fully and firmly. Uh, and, it, and that's part of our, our, our raison d'etre. We must clamor for it. We must. Uh, and you say you cannot separate us because indeed the bar and the bench are essentially inseparable. I mean, um, every member of the bench was once a member of the bar. That's true. Uh, so, so we 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 are um, we are on one side of the fence really, and it is our responsibility to clamour for the independence of the judiciary because that is where we operate, at least as far as the Nigerian legal profession is concerned today. At least, uh, I would say 75% of our members are litigators. They are court-going uh, uh, attorneys, and they operate in that space. And so even from a position of enlightened self-interest, where you have a judiciary that's not independent, it will be very difficult for the lawyer to, to function optimally in the okay. service of his client or her client. Very true. So, so, so there, there's, there, are more than, there, there are a plethora of reasons why lawyers, uh, the NBA, should take it up as a responsibility to clamor for the independence of the judiciary. Having said that, Kaede, the judiciary should also be clamoring for its own independence too. I agree. Okay, let's look at some specifics now uh, because um, probably two, three years tenure, if you were to be the president, two years. and, and uh, there is something very germane which is on the front burner. Uh, the issue of virtual court hearing, the court proceedings, we see the front and back, talking about our current reality, what we call the new normal. And even when judiciary appears to remain 
pardon my language, in the, in the, in the uh, analog, <laughs> analog age where you still do long hand and the rest, the reality is a lot of people have gone virtual. And it appears we are not thinking that way with the back and forth that we are facing. Is this something that is possible? Is this something that is achievable? Probably uh, if you come in. Uh, well, I mean, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, they say, right? So, so that, we will, that the new normal is here is a given, right? We, 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 really have not, we don't have much of a choice with regard to adapting to our new normal and our new realities, right? However, I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon of, of um, oh, virtual hearings. You know, you know, uh, uh, you know there, are, there are buzzwords now, virtual hearing, uh, new normal, technology. No, I, I think, firstly, it's a crying shame that it took COVID for us to realize in the legal services sector that we needed to, we should have, we should have gone digital a long time ago. So that is enough, that's bad enough, right? Now that we have been forced to that realization, I don't subscribe to this knee-jerk reaction. And okay, so we can tick the box and quickly put together a virtual hearing so that everybody sees that we're doing the needful. I think it is important, firstly, have, after kicking ourselves for not being, uh, not, being uh, not having anticipated this kind of uh, uh, necessity, um, I mean, considering that other jurisdictions were doing this already. Then the next thing is to be very deliberate in the way we approach the subject matter and not to try and uh, cobble together some arrangement that we know it would not be sustainable. Mm. You and I know that technology is not, it's not a tea party. It's not something that you can just uh, deploy uh, it's like an on and off uh, switch. There are so many components. There are so many aspects to the virtual hearing that I think it's important that stakeholders have to sit down and fashion out a system that would work. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a start and stop thing. We must, it's something that we would introduce, we should introduce, and it's something that we should introduce with the mindset that it will be long term and it will be sustainable. So um, I think that all stakeholders, including the Nigeria Bar Association, I, I know that the Chief Justice of Nigeria, um, uh, at the, at, in his capacity as the chairman of the NJC, have called uh, all the stakeholders together to fashion out um, hmm. ways of uh, ensuring that this, this, uh, the legal se sector, the justice sector is compliant. But I, I think it's important that we do that, uh, not because we want to play to the gallery. We must do it because we know this is going to be the way our, our professional lives or this sector will be going forward. So we must have a plan to ensure that it is sustainable. So you will not find me say, you know, uh, virtual hearing now. I will be asking, let's do our homework. Okay. What will it take to have a system that, that is, uh, uh, that com that is uh, compatible to this new technology that we want to introduce? What will it take? There's a lot of homework to be done. And um, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not something that I would, I would recommend uh, a quick fix. OK, uh, uh, for the purpose of our viewers, uh, this conversation is not just for lawyers who are definitely members of MBA. Let's also look at how impossible you, you look at this thing that is something that cannot be done immediately. Because average man is looking at it, that what's the big deal? Why can't we have court hearings? Why can't we have true Zoom? Because I recall, maybe it was Femi Falano that made that proposal at the, when this uh, COVID issue started. And what's the big deal? Like in the media now, it's a reality. For like uh, six, three, four, five months, we hardly have guests live in the studio. So I'm saying that, can you be more specific why this is going to be a difficult issue? Because a lot of people will say, uh, Mr. Pata, we'll expect that you will be for, uh, you know, digital age, so to say. Kylie, don't get me wrong. It is not difficult. It's not impossible. I've run my own business for the last 25 years, and technology has been a, uh, has been a, uh, a part of my business, uh, a very, very integral part of my business. But the point I'm making to you is, let us not you know, rush to that, uh, rush into that, the normal uh, way we do things, which is, oh, okay, we just suddenly realized, we've just been slapped in the face, okay, let's rush and do virtual hearing. And then, uh, okay, let me break it down for you, Coyote. Um, do we have power? You know, uh, virtual hearing, a, a, a matter in court is, is, is a, is a multi-party arrangement. 
So each of each council, if they are operating from their own uh, uh, their own uh, offices or locations, they have power, right? They have internet access, right? Uh, have we, have, well, I'm assuming all those questions have been asked and been answered. In a criminal trial, oh, the, the prisons, the prisons have power, right? Uh, um, mm -hmm. They have internet access, high speed, because you need internet access at a certain level so that we can actually uh, run the run the run the the, uh, the sessions, uh, the proceedings uh, in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that would not uh, would be fast and effective, hmm. right? So. I'm just saying to you that technology is something that this kind of arrangement is something that uh, you have to sit down and carefully consider. Okay. So there's a presumption of regularity. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm not holding my breath, but I'm hoping that these issues are being carefully considered. I'm not against it. I'm against some kind of knee jerk and uh, ill thought out uh, uh, program. program. I want us to look at it carefully. It's already bad enough that we are where we are. And we have been where we've been for a while. It's just COVID that has brought us to that realization. And then, but no, I would ask that we painstakingly look through the process. Okay. Or are all the parties able to participate in that kind of? Because you are talking about justice, access to justice. So is a guy going to be denied access to justice because he has no internet access in uh, in uh, in uh, Okutipupa? Okay. You know, uh, uh, pardon me. I'm 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 not very old, but uh, the recent time I've been following NBA, and I'm usually seeing them as SAN, SAN. And when we hear of a pata, we we'll say, oh, there's no SAN to his name. And some have said that, oh, are we going to have some kind of um, a change of status quo where this issue of let it be signed first, that their cases must be listened to. What is going to be your plan for that? Is that the kind of uh, change of status quo we're looking at where it has to be the scheduling of cases will have to follow due process? Well, for me, um, um, for me, I think what we have in the courts is, 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 is essentially, I mean, the stories that come out of our courts, as you may know, I'm not a court going out any, right? I stopped that a long time ago. First three years of my career, I went to court. And it's unfortunate that nothing has changed in the 25 years that uh, since I stopped going to court, nothing has changed. Because I belong to a firm where I have many colleagues who go to court. I run a firm, and they come back and we hear the stories. It's chaotic, right, as far as I'm concerned, with, as regards uh, case management or case shuttling, right? It's chaotic. So it's not so much as um, who should call their case out of turn or their case out of turn. I just think if we order the system properly, Right? I am yet to be convinced that we can't have a case scheduling system in our courts. I refuse to accept that uh, uh, argument because every time we talk about it, somebody comes to tell us reasons why. So I'm not really concerned about who, uh, because if we had a case scheduling system in place, the, there would be no need for anybody to sound time into court and, and want to call his case out of turn because he would have showed up in court knowing the time for which his matter has been slated. Okay. So for me, really, it's, we must, I think, think big picture, take a few steps back, and try and reorder that uh, arrangement. Try and take the chaos out of our court system. Yeah. Why, why, and, and, and then case management also. You know, why would a lawyer need to get to court only to be told that the judge is not sitting? I mean, uh, if we were making better use of technology, and we say we want to do virtual hearing, right? Just even letting the lawyers know that the court will not be sitting today is a huge challenge. I noticed that some courts are now trying to send uh, text messages and all of that, but that is still not the norm. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, so, so uh, uh, we have a few more minutes, but let me quickly listen to you. If you become the NBA president, what are your plans? Let's look at uh, some of the things uh, uh, the NBA has taken in the recent time. I remember how the former CGM was ousted out of power, I'm talking about the Norge, and we saw what NBA did, and it appears it held no water. So uh, how does it function? Is it that NBA just exists as, pardon my language, a toothless bulldog? And what will you do differently if you become the president? Uh, I will pardon your language. Thank you so much. <laughs> but um, but um, what I think, right, uh, firstly, please note that we have elections, but we are not allowed 
uh, as yet the rules do not permit campaigning. So, Scary, let us reframe this conversation and let us talk in terms of what you would like to see uh, the NBA do better, right? Okay. And speaking generally, in general terms, uh, I think the NBA has a role to play in uh, quite a number of things. And the NBA, but firstly for me, uh, the NBA would have to look inwards first. You know, I, I think there are quite a number of things that haven't been done right in terms of its own housekeeping. And it's very difficult to intervene in uh, external affairs, if I may call, call it that, when your internal affairs are really in shambles. So where, what I find, having been a lawyer for close to 30 years, and having been very active at the NBA, what I find is that quite a number of our lawyers are quite dissatisfied with the state of affairs as far as the association is concerned. So if I, were, uh, if I had any say in the matter, I would really look inwards firstly and correct those anomalies that exist with regard to firstly, the, the expectations you have of the NBA, one of the problems I see is that it is unable to meet those expectations, the expectations of its members and members of the public because of a weak, uh, weak system, a weak secretariat. I think that needs to be fixed. That's true. Right? That's, so it really cannot do much if it doesn't fix that. Then, welfare of the lawyers, right? This, the welfare of our members, the remuneration issue, the issue of the ability of the lawyers to earn uh, a good uh, living, right? So welfare of the lawyers is important. Harassment of lawyers by security agents. They make us a punching bag. They shoot the messenger, figuratively and literally. So. Anybody who, 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 who would like to fix the MBA would need to look inwards first. And because if you talk to 10 lawyers today, I'm, I'm quite certain seven will tell you they're, they're not happy to be members of the MBA. And if they had a choice, wow. they will walk away. Then capacity building. Because we are knowledge merchants. What we sell is knowledge. And once that pipeline is, is, a, is, is that's a problem. It's an existential threat. Right? So capacity building put knowledge in the hands of our lawyers. You know why? Because we are the largest economy in Africa, right? Mm. And the legal profession services the economy. And, but right now, we are punching way below our, our weight I, category. I, I need to ask this before you go. Uh, what about the concerns of young lawyers? They believe the profession has not been fair to them. The, the, the huge dichotomy between them and the senior lawyers. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I started my, when I started my firm, I was 23. I've worn the shoe, I know where it pinches. I, 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 I side with the young lawyers. Things are not right. And it starts from the system of legal education. Where, why there's a problem is that the system of train, how we train our lawyers, we are not training our lawyers for contemporary economic realities. So they come out. Right? The tone from the top of the profession is that there's only one sector. The law is only about dispute resolution. So their skills are limited. Therefore, you know, and, and you know we're churning out 7,000 lawyers a year. They come out, they don't have that much they can do. Then people say there are too many lawyers in Nigeria. What happens? Their value dips. You understand? They don't, they don't get paid. People get paid, some lawyers get paid 20,000 a month, right? Even less. So that is the complaint mostly. So firstly, we have to look at their welfare. Secondly, we, firstly, we look at their training. Training. Right? Look at the way they are trained. And that the MBA has a role to play in that because it's part of our mandate, the system of legal, the train, how we train our lawyers. Okay. So training them in school and then continuing legal education. Thank you so much, Olumide Apata, a legal practitioner. And like you said, probably when the campaign comes, we'll have time to listen to you. We listened to Daily uh, Additional, right? Uh, and we also listened to you. And hopefully on Friday, we hope to have Mr. Jibade join us in this conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for speaking to us on the issue of uh, the legal business and how it affects you, uh, every one of us, not just the members of MBA but Nigerians at large. Thank you once again for your Thank time. Thank you for having me, Kayode. Yeah, it's the Plus Politics. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take our Plus report now, and when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Please don't go anywhere. There seems to be no end in sight in reaching a compromise 
as regards the ongoing conflict between the Nigerian Senate and the Federal Ministry of Labor and Productivity. While the Senate insists that the recruitment program remains suspended, the Minister of State for Labor, Festus Kiamu, says the attempt by the Senate to hijack the program is contrary to the provisions of the nation's constitution. He stated that the ministry will revert to President Mohamedou Buhari to make the final decision. The suspension of the program, we are in total support. In fact, any action taken before now is not avoid. You are now going to start it all over. You said there is need for a fresh start. This is going to be a fresh air. When you go to your meeting with the committee, you have your NDE, DG is there. If you want, you can explain the modalities if you might have explained to you because you are the head of the ministry. If you want, you ask him to explain to our committees. Our committees represent the plenary, like you have rightly said. We will wait for our committees to come back and brief us. These are the procedures. We are satisfied. And now we will do oversight from the beginning. From today, once we, you, you engage and the explanations are satisfactory, then NDE starts to put the structure because they would have explained how the selection, the 20 man selection committee would be uh, realized, how they will select people, how the 1,000 people in every local government will be selected or identified, how the program will be judged successful or failed. And I want to assure you, Honorable Minister, we are going to support you all the way. My ministry. We deeply regret the incident that happened at the last visit. The altercations that followed it between my Minister of State and members of the Joint Committee. Therefore, we decided that as a team, we will come in full force and give you the necessary information that we will need so that we can fast track this program, which is uh, a program that, if I must be very frank with you, was designed from the office of Mr. President, even before the COVID pandemic arose. But because fortuitously the, uh, the COVID pandemic afflicted us, it was subsumed into the uh, COVID palliative program of 500 billion. If you look at section 61, they said the minister shall inaugurate committees, shall constitute, I mean, constitute committees for the NDA. The director general of NDA has no such powers to constitute committees by law. He has no such powers under the law. So when you now say, go back and do your work plan and come, are you telling the director general to break the law? Are you telling the director general to disobey his appointee, which is the president? Are you telling the director general to disobey his immediate boss, which is the minister? So that is where, hold on, that is where we are on this issue. So I will go back to my employer, Mr. President. Mr. President, we give directives. The directives as to execution of a project is not binding on me. The directives of uh, the National Assembly is not binding on me. This is, a, this is a great consumer issue that we go to the Attorney General at the end of the day for interpretation. Except, like I said, Mr. President says I should step aside and allow them hijack the process. Because the game, like you have seen today, is simply that they are conniving with a certain functionary of government to design the program, hijack the program against the wishes of Nigerians, hijack it, and that is what I have been against. And I will continue to stand by that. I am sorry, I apologize, these are very distinguished members, but the law is the law. Here is my take. The mantra that the judiciary is the last hope of the masses is under scrutiny as Nigerian Bar Association will elect its new president. 
The expression sounds more theoretical than practical, and the reason is not far-fetched, as, as the cost implication of getting any lawyer, let alone a good lawyer, is a fortune for many of the demography who live on less than $2 a day. How many are on a waiting trial list? How many are being victims of miscarriage of justice by non-diligent benchers? The sad narrative is that the solution still lies in this harm of government, especially in a democratic government. The executive and the legislature over time have disappointed these electorates who are closer or should be closer to them. And so, we run back to the judiciary for succor through the MBA. We sincerely hope that the mantra becomes true in its true sense. And that's the wrap on today's program of Plus Politics. Thanks for staying. Thanks for staying with us while the program lasted. In return, same time tomorrow. Have a great evening. I am Coyote Ladeni. Saying bye for now.